from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight, I want to turn you to turn with me to a very familiar passage of Scripture to all of you. And uh, that is uh, found in Romans, the first chapter, and the 17th verse. And then I want us to turn over to Galatians, the sixth chapter, where in the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul is explaining what he meant in the 17th verse of the first chapter. And this was the verse that shook all of Europe a little over 500 years ago when it was discovered and it was revealed to him in a powerful way to Martin Luther. First chapter of Romans, the 17th verse. And therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Not by our own goodness, not by our own works, but by faith. By grace are ye saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then we turn over to Galatians, the sixth chapter. What a marvelous chapter this fifth chapter is, and the sixth chapter. And the sixth chapter has something I want to speak on, and I've never before preached a sermon on this text. Be beginning with verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. I want to speak tonight on sowing and reaping. I noticed as we came in the lush farmland that's here in this Red River Valley. I guess there's nothing quite like it in the United States. I used to come to Fargo quite often, stop here at Fargo, Moorhead. You couldn't get to Winnipeg without stopping on Northwest Airlines here on a DC-3. Back in the 40s, we used to go back and forth to Winnipeg a lot, and we stopped here a lot. And I would see this country and often marvel at its lushness and congratulate you and your grandparents and parents that came here and settled here because this has become one of the great areas of the entire United States. I was born and reared on a farm, and I've read about families that have been losing their family farms, and I was reared on a family farm. And I remember the days back in the 20s and the 30s, back during the Depression when my father would look for rain and we would pray for rain, and we raised wheat and barley and grain. We didn't have sugar beets, but we did raise other things that would be familiar to you. Then my father had a, what he called a truck farm where he raised vegetables. And then we had dairy cattle and we milked. And every morning from the time I was about seven or eight, I had to get up at three o'clock and go milk cows. And when I was in high school, I milked 20 cows every morning before I went to school and milked those same 20 when I came home from school. And so I knew a little bit about farm work. Now, I believe that they're in the Bible there are five laws in sowing and reaping. First, you must sow to reap. In China, 2,000 years old seed were taken from an ancient tomb and they're sprouting today and growing tomatoes, even though they were sown 2,000 years ago. But it wasn't until they were sown that they could produce a crop for reaping. We have to sow to reap. Now in Hosea, it says, sow to yourselves in righteousness. Think of it, sow in goodness, sow in righteousness, reap in mercy. If you sow in righteousness, living a good life, putting your faith and your confidence in Christ, you are going to reap the mercy of God and the grace of God and salvation. For it is time, the scripture says, to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Has righteousness reigned upon you? Because unless you are clothed in the cloth of the righteousness of God, you'll never enter heaven. And that suit of clothes or that dress of righteousness was provided by the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you. We have a cross on our, all of our churches, whatever our denomination may be. We agree on one thing, that the cross is the central fact of Christianity. 
And it's on the cross that Christ hung for our sins and died for us and provided for us a righteousness that you cannot provide for yourself. In Psalm 126, 5, it says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross in tears, as it were, so that we might have the joy of salvation. Now, if you want to become a lawyer or a doctor or a scientist or a professor, you have to spend years of study. You, sto you sow study and you reap professionally. There was a hillbilly from the South who felt lost at Times Square, New York. So he asked a young fellow with a long beard, how, is the, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And snapping his fingers, the bearded man replied, practice man, practice. <laughs> and to be a great musician like Pavarotti, you have to practice passionately and perpetually. You reap excellence if you sow effort, but you have to sow in order to reap. Have you been sowing in good deeds? Have you been sowing in repentance? Have you been sowing in faith? Have you been sowing in Bible reading and prayer and church going faithfully? Have you been sowing so you can reap the grace and the mercy of God? Or have you been sowing the wild oats that so many people sow? Or been sowing things for your own lust and your own pleasures? And you're going to reap someday that which you have sowed. And then the second thing, if you sow, you will reap. Every person is a sower and a reaper. Now the Bible teaches that Satan is a deceiver. And in Galatians 6 it says, be not deceived. Many of you are already deceived. He that soweth to his flesh, that is lust, drugs, wrong kinds of sex, too much drink, shall of the flesh reap corruption. In Proverbs 6 it says, A wicked man soweth discord, therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. The Bible warns that if we continue that kind of life, we will be broken. We'll, we're going to reap what we sow. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in his The Reaper and the Flowers says, Though the mills of God grind slowly, yet they grind exceedingly small. You remember Cain became jealous of his brother Abel, and he killed his brother in a fit of jealousy and rage and became the first murderer, and that was the first war, and that took place in paradise. Many people say, oh, if we only change society, if we make the world better, if we spend more money, if everybody had everything they wanted, it would, they would, we would produce a new man. This is what uh, Marx taught. This is what Lenin strongly believed. He had great ideals. He believed that they would ultimately produce a new man. But we've lived long enough now to know that it has not produced a new man. The only person that can produce a new man is the one that said, you must be born again. It doesn't mean really born again. It means born from above, born by the Spirit of God. Just as you were born into the physical world and from your mother's womb, you must be born into the spiritual world. And so in one sense, it's being born the second time. The third thing is you will reap what you sow. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In Numbers 32, it says, be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure your sin, and we're all sinners. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And sin means the breaking of God's law, the breaking of the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says if you break those commandments in one place, you're guilty of all. And we're all sinners and we've broken all the commandments. We all need the mercy and the grace and the love of God. Be sure. Your sin will find you out. Every sin that has ever been committed is going to be found out either in this life or at the judgment. Somewhere, sometime, every little sin that you've committed and every big sin will find you out. Because you remember the tapes? 
back in Watergate days and what they did to a president? God has tapes far more sophisticated. Not only does he record all of our actions, but all of our thoughts, all of our words, all of our intents are recorded. And you may deny it at the judgment and say, God, it just didn't happen that way. He's got it all there. He has every moral choice you faced and he has the road that you took. You'll reap what you sow. In Job 4, it says, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. You're going to reap. Everything that you sow, you'll reap. I read in Time Magazine review of a book entitled Wild Oats. And some people live by the philosophy that you sow your wild oats all week, then go to church on Sunday morning and pray for a crop failure. It's not going to be that way. The crop is going to come in. And how many of us go to church and we really don't know Christ? I did. I was really a Presbyterian. And I was baptized. I was confirmed in the church. And I thought everything was all right. I thought the minister was a little bit boring. I didn't particularly like going to church, but I went because my parents told me to go. And if you knew my father, you know you'd go if he told you. But I really didn't have Christ in my heart. I didn't have assurance. I didn't know that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I wasn't sure of that. I wasn't certain that my sins had been forgiven. So one day when they had an evangelistic meeting, I went forward and received Christ into my heart and recommitted my life to Christ. And I remember the things that I promised those elders when I met with them at the time of confirmation. And I said, Lord, I'm going to recommit my life to you. I'm going to surrender to you. I'm not sure where I stand, but I want to be sure. And that simple decision changed my entire life. But life doesn't always work that way. In Proverbs 28, it says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. God is willing to have mercy upon you. He's willing to bestow his grace upon you. He's willing to forgive you if you willing to repent of your sin and receive him. You see, the Bible says that sin is no respect of persons. In James 1, it says, Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. And that death is not only natural death when your body dies, but you can be dead right now where you're sitting, spiritually dead. You're dead toward God. That's the reason people can't find peace and joy and happiness today. They search for it. They want it, but they can't find it. You can't find it in drugs. You can't find it in an extramarital affair. You can't find it any other place. Oh, you can have a temporary time. You can get drunk and go out with some girl and have a good time for a while, but it soon wears off. It's gone. I had a bishop. We've had a number of bishops, but one bishop in particular who came forward in our meeting, an Anglican bishop in England. And later, I saw him privately. And I said, Bishop, why did you have to come forward? He said, you know, I've been to the university, I've gotten my degrees, and I've been to the theological school and all the rest. And he said, I'm, I'm now in my 50s and I'm a bishop. But he said, I am not sure where I stand before God. And I just wanted to make sure. Do you feel that way? You can make sure tonight before you leave here. And then the fourth thing, the ignorance of what you are sowing won't keep you from reaping. Leviticus 19, 19 says, Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. The Bible teaches that when the good seed of the Word of God is sown, the devil comes along and sows tares. Jesus said, you can sow or allow to be sowed in your life to the devil and you'll reap hell. The devil for thousands of years has been issuing an invitation to hell to all of those who sow to the sins of the flesh, to those who permit Satan to sow tares in their lives. Come to Christ now. Give him your life. On the cross, Jesus Christ conquered Satan and hell and sin. And in 1 John 3, 8, it says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, 
For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil so that we might live the life after Christ. 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Christ comes to live within you and gives you a new power to live a life that you never dreamed you could live. And he produces within you love and joy and peace and satisfaction and fulfillment that you never knew before. And he puts you on the right road because Jesus said there are two roads of life, the broad road that leads to destruction and the narrow road that leads to life everlasting. And then fifthly and lastly, you will reap more than you sow. Hosea 8, 7 says, They have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. John 4, 36 says, He receiveth wages that reaps. Charles Reed wrote a century ago, Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Lord Macaulay, the great historian, once wrote, old men reap. Someone was showing a clergyman through one of the prisons the other day in the east and they saw an old man sitting there weeping and they asked the warden what is he doing and the warden replied he's reaping and that's where many of us are going. We're going to a place where we're going to reap. We've been sowing all these weeks and months and years and we think we're getting by with it. Our conscience no longer bothers us. Why? Because the Bible teaches that you can harden your conscience. You can cause it to become dead. It no longer speaks. It's no longer an accurate guide for you. Come to Christ and he'll resensitize your conscience. A hundred million people die every year. 270 million die every day. 10,000 people die every hour. 180 die every minute. Three die every second. And you will be one of those statistics one of these days. Are you ready to meet God? The Bible says prepare to meet God. Jesus said the dead shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Two crowds. You say, well, Billy, what do I have to do to make sure, to make certain? Many people want to be sure, but they don't know what to do. First, you must repent of sin. The word repent means to turn, to change, to change the direction of your life, to change your mind. You change your mind about God, you change your mind about yourself and your need of God, and you go home ready to change the way you treat your wife or your husband or your parents or your children or your neighbors or the people you work with. You're ready for a change. Second, you put your total confidence and your total faith in Christ alone. You're not depending on anything else for your future salvation except the cross and the resurrection of Christ. For by the grace of God are you saved. The word grace means unmerited favor, something I don't deserve. Billy Graham doesn't deserve to go to heaven. I deserve to go to the judgment. I deserve hell. But I'm going to heaven by the grace of God by Christ who died on the cross and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in that terrible moment, something happened that none of us really understands. God laid on him the sins of us all. Jesus became the great sin bearer. He died for us. Then he comes into our hearts and he gives us a power to do good works. And we go out with a burden for our neighbors, a burden for peace in the world, for a burden to help the hungry, to feed the poor, to help the poor. That's our responsibility as believers. But we don't have the power to do the things we ought to do or to live the life we ought to do. But Jesus Christ gives it to you. He rose again. And we reap eternal life, forgiveness, peace, joy, love. The power of the Holy Spirit comes within eternity in heaven. We sang the song a moment ago, Amazing Grace. Do you know the story of that song? It was written by a slaver, a man by the name of John Newton. And John Newton became the slave of a slave in West Africa. 
One day, when he was coming back to England on the slave ship and treating the slaves miserable and terrible, they had a thunderstorm. And he fell on his face and he remembered some scriptures that his mother had taught him when he was a boy. And he received Christ into his heart and it changed his life. And he went back to England and became a great friend of those who were to someday lead the fight against slavery in Parliament and did more to help probably than any other person motivate the British people toward outlawing slavery. He himself became the minister of an Anglican church. He himself wrote many hymns. And that was one of the hymns he wrote, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. I don't deserve it. John Newton said, I don't deserve it. And when he was an old man and he could barely get up into the pulpit and he was in his middle 80s, he held on to the pulpit and he said, I don't know much. But he said, I do know this, that I'm a great sinner and I have a great Savior. And John Newton left his mark for God after being a terrible sinner. You can be forgiven of any sin, any failure. It may be hypocrisy, whatever it is, but tonight you'd like to make sure. I'm going to ask you to do something that I've asked Africans for the thousands to do, Asians for the thousands, Europeans for the thousands, Americans for the thousands, and I've seen them do it for the thousands. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat where you're sitting right now and come and stand in front on this beautiful turf and stand there for a moment or two quietly and say, you know, I want to be sure about this. I want to be sure my sins are forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want this supernatural peace and joy and fulfillment that Christ can give me. And I want to settle it. I would like to rededicate myself to my confirmation vows or to my ba what my baptism meant. Whatever the reason, whatever your need, I'm going to ask you to get up and come and stand. And after you've all come and stood there, I'm going to have a prayer with you and give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. Or you may be the only one from your area to come, but get up and come. I'm going to ask that no one leave the stadium now at this holy moment. And everyone in an attitude of prayer, you get up and come. You may be a member of the church. You may not be a member of any church. I don't know who you are, but you need Christ. You come right now. We're going to wait on you. Just come and stand here quietly, young and old, whatever, whoever you are. We're going to wait, Catholic or Protestant, Jewish, whatever. You come and stand here and say yes and make sure of your relationship to Christ. And you may be in the choir or you may just be somebody that wandered in, but God is speaking to you. You come. Just stand here in front behind those cameras that are around here or right in here. We're going to wait on you, quickly. Bring somebody with you. Or with your family. Make your surrender to Christ now and say, Lord, I need you. Come into my heart. Forgive my sin. Give me assurance of my own faith. I'm going to pray that you'll make that commitment now. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'll just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers.
from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. I want to speak tonight on the home. In the 11th Psalm, there's a familiar passage that many of you know. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations be destroyed, and the foundation of any society is the home. And then a verse that goes with it, 82nd Psalm, these words, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the world are out of course. Doesn't that sound like our day? All the foundations of the earth are out of course, and we're walking in darkness. We're stumbling. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, and he could bring light. Now, there's someone that has, I've had the privilege of sharing a home with for 42 years. She's the mother of our five children. She's the grandmother of our 16 grandchildren. She's on the platform. She could not be here most of Mission England last summer because she's been in and out of the hospital. Nothing terribly serious except uh, she had to have a new hip put in and she had to have an operation on her esophagus because, uh, well, several years ago, she was fixing a swing for the grandchildren and she fell out of a tree and broke a number of bones and disoriented her insides. And she's now well for the first time in a long time. And uh, she coughs still a little bit. And I've asked her if she'll say a word. And she's a little bit nervous that she might cough. And if she does, just wait. She's got something more to say after that. So uh, I'm going to ask Ruth to come. People, people many, many reporters ask me, who is the greatest Christian I've ever known? I always answer, Ruth. She is the greatest Christian I've ever known. No, but happy, caring Christians have been a part of my heritage. In 1916, my parents landed in, in Shanghai, China, and spent the next 25 years of their li lives serving the people of China as medical missionaries. It wasn't easy. Those were troubled times with wars, disease, bandits, floods, and famine. And yet, because of them, we never knew what fear was. Daily in the home, there were family prayers with hymns, and scripture reading and prayer. We were lovingly disciplined. We were tr carefully trained. But not only did mother and daddy teach the Christian faith in the home, they lived it. And as a consequence, it was easy as a child to give my heart to the Lord Jesus. Later they came to the States and we had the joy of living beside them for the last 25 years of their lives. And because of their Christian example, our five children were tremendously influenced. And due in a good part to them, they too gave their hearts to the Lord Jesus. I remember the last year of his life, Daddy was elected moderator of our church. Now, he wasn't well at that time himself, and my mother had had a stroke and was in a wheelchair. But one morning I went down to check on them and Daddy was on his knees in front of Mother helping her put on her stockings and he glanced up at me over his glasses and he said, you know these are the greatest years of our lives. Caring for your mother has been the greatest privilege of my life. And the thing was, he really meant it. And so I thank God tonight for a Christian home and for what it has meant to me, to our children, and if you haven't had a Christian home, you can give your children a Christian home. And if your children have already grown up and left home, you can recommit your life to Christ and look around for some other young person to help. God bless you tonight. Thank you.
That's the first time she's spoken in public in at least a year or 18 months. And I'm very <laughs> thankful. I think all of us are aware that something is wrong with our homes. As someone has said that all weddings are happy. It's the living together afterward that causes all the trouble. And there's some truth to that. An American psychologist says marriage is a quiet hell for about half of all American couples. Now what is wrong? Can the tide be reversed? Because the same could be said perhaps about the United Kingdom or the Ireland, wherever people are watching or listening. And I want to ask you this question on the scripture that we read. Is your home built on a solid foundation? Is it when floods of sorrow come, or the waves of temptation, or the gales of adversity, of war, death, or judgment strike? Will your home stand? Is the foundation strong? Social researchers are finding that in times of stress, rather than bringing families together, many marriage partners find it easier to flee from the struggle with the overwhelming emotions that family tragedies generate. One of our most famous families got involved in a terrible tragedy a few years ago. Their daughter was kidnapped, and they stuck together, and they prayed together, and they worked together, and they paid out thousands of dollars, and finally, she was rescued after about a year or two. But soon after she came home, they divorced. The emotions, the stress, the strain was too great, and that family broke up. Now, the Apostle Paul was ministering in Corinth, which was a hedonistic city, a pagan city, an immoral city. And he said this, he said, Let every man take heed how he builds, for other foundation can no man build except that which is in Jesus Christ. If you build your home on Jesus Christ, the problems of the home are going to be far lessened and the problems of divorce may never come. We have found in a survey in the United States that where there's Bible reading and prayer and church attendance in the home, we only have one divorce out of every 300 marriages. But the national average is almost one out of every two, which indicates if you build it upon Christ, that's the answer to the breaking of the home today. Now, Christ was born in an earthly home, and he lived under parental discipline. His first miracle was performed at a wedding ceremony. Christ's father died when he was young, apparently. There's no mention of him after he was 12 years of age, so maybe Jesus Christ, being the oldest son, was the breadwinner of the family. I don't know. But he knew all the problems of the home, and a favorite benediction of his was upon entering our home was, Peace be upon this house. And Jesus said that the entry into the spiritual family is like the entry into a domestic family. It's through birth. He said you must be born from above. You must be born again. Born into God's family. You were born into the present family in which you live or another family but you're born into God's family also. If you want to get to heaven, if you want to have your sins forgiven, if you want to know that you have eternal life, you must be born, born into God's family by repentance of faith and receiving, by repentance of your sins and receiving him by faith. Now, Jesus Christ advocated household salvation. To Zacchaeus, he said, this day is salvation come to your house. And whenever he saved or healed someone, his first concern was that they go home and tell their family about it. Some of them wanted to follow him from that day on. He said, no, go and tell your family. Go back and tell your community. Go tell others. 
to the restored demon-possessed man, his command was, return to your own house and show what great things God has done for you. And perhaps some of you are here tonight just embarking on your married life together. Maybe you're here on your honeymoon. And you could give one another no greater wedding gift than a young couple did the other night here at this stadium. They'd just been married, and the first thing they did was to come to this stadium and come forward and give their lives to Christ together. They said, we want to start our married life with Christ. That could happen to you tonight. Maybe you've been married 20 years or 30 years or 10 years, whatever, but you've never done that. Now, first, a successful home must be founded on a divinely ordered marriage. Remember, God performed the first marriage. Adam and Eve had an ideal marriage. Adam didn't have to hear about all the other men she could have married. And she didn't have to hear about the way his mother cooked. <laughs> if we disregard the, God's suggestions and regulations for the home, it is in danger of ending in failure. But many people are reluctant to make a commitment. Physical love is not enough. It's commitment that carries over the difficult times. When you get married, you're committing for life. It's commitment that's kept Ruth and me together in times of stress or strain or difficulty. We wouldn't think of being separated or getting a divorce no matter what the problem was. Maybe she has, I never have. She once told someone she'd thought of murder, but not divorce. Now, another cornerstone in the successful home and marriage is a spiritual exercise. Prayer, Bible reading, fellowship with other believers. In Deuteronomy 6, it says, and these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently unto your children. Do you say grace at the meal? Do you say prayer at the meal? Do you have prayer in the home? Do you and your wife ever read the Bible and pray together? And then thirdly, a successful home must be founded on a dedicated husband and father, as we've already said a moment ago. I heard about one clergyman before the children were born who wrote an article on the Ten Commandments for raising children. After he'd had the first child, he wrote an article, and he changed the title, and he said, 10 suggestions how to rear children. After the third child, he wrote 10 hints on how to raise children. After the fifth child, he didn't write any more. Now, I used to be very authoritative about how to rear children until we had five. And I let my wife take over from there. And she did a terrific job, let me tell you. It's a big responsibility. When a man loves his wife as Christ loves the church, it's easy for the wife to submit to the husband. The image here is not of a mighty potentate sitting up on the throne and ruling his subjects with an iron hand. This is more like a conductor standing on his box directing a symphony, delicate but subdued. Is that the kind of a husband you are? The Bible says live joyfully with the wife of thy youth. It doesn't say go out and get you a younger woman. It says live with the wife of your youth, the one you married when you were young. Be faithful. How many men when they reach the age of 40 or 50 or 60 want to prove their virility and go out and get some young thing? That's not commitment. That is a sin against God. I read a newspaper story where it discussed several recent movies that deal with adultery as a positive growth experience. Don't you ever believe anything like that? That'll destroy our culture as quick as anything. The Bible says that unfaithfulness is the pathway to hell. And then fourthly, 
A successful home must have a devoted wife and mother. Napoleon said the greatest need of France was mothers. One of the vices which is hitting our wives and mothers today in the world is alcoholism and drugs. You see, they don't have Christ to turn to. And when you're rearing children, and when you're married, you need a resource. You need help. And that comes from God, a relationship to God. Just as the husband, to be the right kind of a husband, needs Christ, so to be the right kind of a wife or a mother, you need Christ. And so many don't have Christ, so they turn to something else to help them. A Christian home has a devoted mother and wife. Now I know that in a place like Sheffield, where there's a, or Yorkshire, places in America like in Michigan, where there's great unemployment, women have to go to work. And I want to commend you for helping in the home and being willing to sacrifice by earning to help in the home during a time of depression or recession or lack of income in the home. And then fifthly, a successful home is based upon disciplined and obedient children. Now children can absorb any amount of love and discipline as long as the two are kept in balance. I heard a psychiatrist say at Columbia University many years ago in the United States, he said, if your children rebel, keep their love at all costs. They'll come through it, and when they come through that period, the love will be there, and you won't have to reestablish anything. The scripture says, train up a child in the way he should go. Not the way he would go, but the way he should go. And we're to do it by setting an example of love and discipline together and in balance with each other. And when he's old, the scripture says, he'll not depart. He'll come back someday. Like the prodigal son, the father never gave up loving the son, and he came back. Your son, your daughter will come back if you've trained them correctly when they were children and lived an example of Christ in front of them. But if you haven't lived an example in front of them, don't expect God to do great miracles. He might. He will, as I'll show you in just a moment, right here in Sheffield, what he's doing in some families right now. Your social and domestic responsibilities make your individual response to Christ that much more significant. On the other hand, if you're here with part or all of your family tonight, and the Lord says to you as he invited Noah, come thou and all thy house into the ark, the scripture says, come, husband and wife, come forward together. Father, son, come together. Daughter, mother, come together. Whoever you are, if you hear the still, small voice of God within prompting you, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Come as a family or come alone. But don't leave here until you know Christ because you can't be the right kind of husband and father. You can't be the right kind of mother or wife or child in the home without Christ. And once you've heard the message as you've heard it tonight, your responsibility is so great because he says, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. He that hardeneth his heart being often reproved shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. Here's a letter that says, Dear Dr. Graham, I had to write you to tell you this time last year my divorce papers were through. My husband was a minor on strike. My children's lives were in tatters because of my own sins. My young son was turning to crime at 13 years of age. My daughter was emotionally hurt, coping with my sins and unemployment after finishing college. For years, I'd been delving into the supernatural, reading cards of fortune, 
and rapidly going to hell. I reached it when my marriage smashed and I thought it was my life to do what I wanted with. It was not always like that. We'd had a good marriage for 21 years. A bus with Billy Graham worth listening to kept passing my husband on the miners' picket line. It bugged him, tormented him, hounded him so much day after day that one dismal rainy night he took me along to hear what this Billy Graham fella had to shout about. The divorce was almost through. My son was due in court. I went in anger thinking it was all so stupid. But Jesus cracked me that night. I broke my heart before him. I gave my life a year ago to one of the relays. She was in a relay. And I was born again. Three weeks ago, my husband was baptized. Saturday night, my daughter gave her life to Christ at Bramall Lane. My son didn't come, but gave over his life six months ago. This year, I'm a counselor, hoping to be God's servant. Dr. Graham, I know this will be thank you amongst thousands, but thank you for giving God's word last year on the brink of this family's near total destruction. This whole family is reunited in the love of God. It's not been easy. We have all had to hand things over to him, but oh my God, what he's given us in return. That's one family. And we have hundreds and scores of letters along similar lines from last year's mission and this year's mission here. What about you? I'm going to ask you to come tonight. You say, what do I have to do? I'm going to ask you to do what we've already seen thousands of people do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say, I'm a sinner. I need Christ. I want him to come into my life. I want him to come into my home. I'm ready to surrender and commit myself totally without reservation to him. But why do I ask people to come forward publicly? Because every person that Jesus called publicly, I called, he called publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. There's something about coming forward publicly like this that makes it real and genuine in your life. So I'm going to ask you to get up right now and come. If you come from that top stand up there, it's going to take two or three minutes. So start right now. And you along here and back here and all over this great stadium, you get up and come. We're going to wait on you and surrender your life to Christ. Maybe whole families will come. Maybe husbands and wives or sweethearts will come. Just get up and come. We're going to wait on you right now, quickly. On your television screen, there's a number that you can call for spiritual health and counsel. People are standing by ready to talk to you from the Word of God about the problem that you face, about the decision that you need to make. We want to help you. If the line is busy, just wait a few moments and call again. Make that call now. watching by television you can make your commitment just now as you see hundreds of people are coming here to make their commitment in Sheffield in South Yorkshire England you that are watching in America 
you can pick up a telephone and call that number that you see on the screen in Canada or the United States. And their counsel is standing by to talk to you. And if you get a busy signal, call again. They'll be there all evening. And give your life to Christ. Maybe a whole family will give their life to Christ tonight on that telephone. We're going to pray for you as you make that commitment. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peace.